It was December 1st, 1955, that Rosa Parks famously s s refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white passenger in Montgomery, Alabama, thus launching the modern-day civil rights movement. When she died in 2005, one network described her as a tired steamstress. They said she was no troublemaker. But the media got it wrong. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. Today, we spend the hour looking at this often ignored side of her remarkable life. It's told in the new Peacock documentary, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. I felt that I had a message, but people did not choose to listen to what I was saying. We all understand that she sat down on the bus. The policeman, he said, why don't you stand up? I said, I don't think I should have to stand up. The narrow narrative of her just on one day did something. Couldn't be further from the truth. Often, the man is out front, and you never hear about the wife. The reverse is true. She was considered a threat. Espousing radical views. If they could see her talking about the Republic of New Africa, her out there with the Panthers, then they would understand the real world parts, but they might have been just a little frightened. She has been an activist for over three decades. For Ms. Parks, it was especially dangerous. Fighting on issues that are still very much at the forefront. She never gave up. She lit the torch to the next generation. That's the trailer for The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, set to air on Peacock Wednesday, October 19th. Well, on Friday, I spoke with two people involved in the film, Yoruba Richens, the film's co-director, acclaimed filmmaker, former Democracy Now! producer, founding director of the documentary program at the Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. I also spoke with Jean Theo Harris, professor of political science at Brooklyn College, author of the award-winning biography, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, on which the new documentary is based. I began by asking Yoruba Richen why she chose to take on this project and why she felt it was important to tell the story of Rosa Parks over a half a century later. I was uh, contacted by my co-director, Joanna Hamilton, um, who had uh, connected with Jean about the book um, and was quite astonished that uh, a full-length documentary film had not been made <laughs> about Rosa Parks. Um, and she contacted, she read the book, uh, contacted me and asked if I wanted to, to work with, told me to read the book and asked if I wanted to work with her uh, on getting a document, on making a documentary. And as I was reading the book again and again, I was um, astonished to learn so much more about uh, Mrs. Parks' life and her work and her activism. And I just thought it was a, you know, a story that hadn't been told um, on so many different, you know, so many different levels uh, in terms of the work that the activism and work that uh, Mrs. Parks did before the bus boycott, um, her uh, relationship with her husband um, and how he brought her into activism, uh, and all of her work post the boycott, uh, how she got to Detroit um, and, you know, the work work that she did uh, in Detroit. And I have to say, Amy, um, I don't know if you, rem you remember, but we were in D.C. Uh, at, at the memorial for her. I was working for Democracy Now! You know— um, and. Uh, that's, you know, we were at her beautiful memorial. memorial. It, it was astounding. And I remember, of course, when we hopped on the train, I was watching CNN in the newsroom here at Democracy Now! And it said Rosa Parks had died, and there was going to be this memorial, right? First um, woman and second African-American to lie in state in the Capitol Rotunda, uh, that she was an amazing woman, because she was really just a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker they said. Well, of mm. course, that's exactly what she was, <laughs> and it's exactly what you document in this amazing film and Jean Theo Harris that you wrote about in The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. We hopped on that train, went down to tell that story. I mean, thousands came yeah. out for—and this wasn't even the big funeral in Detroit. This was right. just— this wasn't, right, yeah. To this honor was, her, it Cicely was incredible Tyson to see and that. Oprah Winfrey were yeah. inside. Now, so yep. that takes us to Jean. Jean, you're an academic, you're a professor. Uh, 
talk about your investigations of the civil rights movement and then realizing what we didn't know about a woman who perhaps everyone knows her name, Rosa Parks. Right. And I think you and Yoruba, starting with that memorial, that funeral, is actually where I started, because I was both transfixed by it. It's an incredible, really unprecedented honor um, for a woman activist, for a civil rights activist. And yet, as both of you are noting, she gets smaller and smaller in it. Um, she's talked about as accidental. She's talked about as, not, right, not a troublemaker. She's incessantly referred to as quiet, not angry, humble, quiet. Uh, and so I, I do a talk a few months later on how we memorialize uh, the civil rights movement, because to me, we couldn't separate her funeral and this outpouring of Congress, this kind of stampede of congressional leaders wanting to honor Mrs. Parks, from what happened two months earlier, which was the travesty of Hurricane Katrina and the federal negligence after the storm, dur during, before and after the storm. And so this to me, was inseparable. So I do a couple of talks, and a friend says, will you turn that talk into a chapter for this book I'm doing? So I'm thinking to myself, sure, but now I need to tell a little fuller story about Mrs. Parks than I knew. There's got to be a good biography. And I look, and there's no serious biography of Rosa Parks. Mm. And until my book comes out in 2013, there is no serious footnote or biography of her. But when I start to look—and I'm coming to this as, an, as a scholar of the civil rights movement outside of the South—and one of the first things that I start to realize is how huge her political life is after the boycott. They're forced to leave Monk— Montgomery, in 57, eight months after the boycott successful end, moved to Detroit, to what she describes as the northern promised land that wasn't. And so she'll spend the next 40 years fighting the racism, the school segregation, the housing segregation, the job discrimination, the police brutality of the North. And that whole second half, right, even those of us who knew she wasn't just a simple seamstress, had really missed that second half, missed all of her connections to black power, missed all of her connections to the anti-war movement in the 60s, to the anti-apartheid movement. And so there was just this much bigger story to tell. And I realize it's not just an article, it's a book. Well, before we move forward in her life, from sitting down on the bus December 1st, 1955, let's go back. In this clip from The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, she describes how her grandfather's response to racism shaped her as a child. We hear actress Lisa Gay Hamilton reading from Rosa Parks' letters. By the time I was six, I was old enough to realize that we were actually not free. The Ku Klux Klan was riding through the black community, burning churches, killing people. I later learned that it was because African-American soldiers were returning from World War I and acting as if they deserved equal rights because they had served their country. At one point, the violence was so bad that my grandfather kept his gun close by at all times grandfather was going to defend his home, whatever happened. I wanted to see him shoot that gun. And in this clip from The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, we learn about her husband, Raymond Parks, known as Parks. Raymond Parks was the first real activist I ever met. He was a longtime member of the NAACP. He was the first man I had met since the death of my grandfather that was not ready to accept what we call buying and scraping and yes, yesing. He was in his late twenties and working as a barber in the black barber shop in downtown Montgomery. A mutual friend introduces Rosa and Raymond Parks to one another. Rosa's initially not interested. I thought he was too white. I had an aversion to white men with the exception of my grandfather and Raymond Parks is very light-skinned. And her experience with light-skinned black men is that they're usually politically timid. Couldn't be further from the truth, right, about Raymond. Parks, everyone called him Parks, would tell me about his problems growing up being very fair-complected. 
He's also the owner of a Red Nash. He had a car, a little Red Nash with a rumble seat. You know, that was something very special. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it was a young man to own his own car, especially when he wasn't driving in the, in the white boat. An excerpt of The Rebellious Life of Rosa Parks. Yoruba Richin, this rich history. I mean, the story of Rosa Parks tells us the story of the 20th century, from the grandfather in World War I to her husband, uh, Raymond Parks, and their partnership. Tell us about her family and how that shaped her and how what it tells us about the history of this country. Yeah, I mean, it's really remarkable to think that, you know, some of her earliest memories are sitting with her grandfather, um, uh, watching the Ku Klux Klan try to, you know, t intimidate and terrorize their house, and her grandfather defending, uh, with a gun, defending his family. Um, you know, I think that also tells us so much about uh, the role of self-defense in our struggle, not only our freedom struggle, but our struggle to stay alive uh, in this country. And that self-defense was always a part of um, our our strategy for uh, fighting for our rights and for and for our our body bodily integrity. Um, and she really epitomized that, and you see that. That, you know, throughout her life. Um, and also her uh, grandfather's, uh, her grandfather's, um, uh, you know, both, both descendants of her family being descendants of slaves, um, her mother's uh, value on, on education uh, being sent to Miss White's school, where she learned, uh, you know, flourished as a, as a reader and a, and a lover of history. Um, this was a really uh, intelligent um, woman who, you know, she says that if she, unfortunately, she wasn't able to go to college, but she, you know, what she would have liked to do uh, if she, you know, if she was able to. Uh, and um, her family uh, took her in after uh, she had to leave Detroit, after she had to leave Montgomery for Detroit, and, and protected her. Um, and we really wanted to tell that story, that personal story of who she was, because, again, you know her name, uh, but we don't know, you know, so much, and we certainly didn't know her, her personal her personal story. And as we continue to look at the new Peacock documentary, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, that premieres Wednesday. In a moment, we'll continue our conversation with the film's co-director, Yoruba Richin, and Professor Jean Theo Harris. But first, let's go back to the documentary. In this clip, actress Lisa Gay Hamilton reads from Rosa Parks' letters about her investigation in 1944 of what happened to Reese Taylor, black mother and sharecropper raped by six white men in Alabama. I remember one case out in Abbeville, Alabama, where my father and his family came from. Mrs. Reese Taylor was on her way home from church when she was kidnapped, forced into a car at gun and knife point, stripped of her clothing, and raped by six white men on September 3, 1944. Then put a blindfold over, took her back and dumped her in the middle of town, and said, if you tell nobody, we'll kill you. She went promptly to the sheriff and told him. And they realized that nothing's going to happen to these, these men. Rosa Parks hears about this from a white woman they know through Scottsboro organizing. So Rosa Parks and some of her comrades decide that they should investigate it. Rosa Parks was sent to get the testimony in those times to go 100 miles from home. The sheriff is outside, driving by, and he goes again. Well, there he is. I just only can imagine what that must have been like, sitting there and actually having her tell that story and Rosa Parks writing down every word. It was incredibly dangerous for um, a black woman to report, to detail, that they had been the victims of sexual violence. For Ms. Parks, it was especially dangerous going into communities because she was seen as the problem. 
in collaboration with several other activists. They'd go as far as to take out an ad in the local newspaper in order to let people know what had taken place and to place pressure on law enforcement to do something. Again, that clip from The Rebellious Life of Rosa Parks, the same title as the book on which it's based, um, by Jean Theo Harris. Uh, Jean, if you can tell us more about how this shaped, this the rape of Reese Taylor shaped, and also the reference before that to the Scottsboro Boys, Rosa Parks meant with all of this. So, Rosa Parks gets involved with the Scottsboro case because of Raymond. Um, when she meets Raymond in 1931, as we heard her say in that clip earlier, he's the first real activist I ever met. And what he's doing in 1931 is organizing around the Scottsboro case, organizing these are nine young men who were riding the rails. They get arrested. When two white women are found in the train, that charge changes to rape. They're quickly tried, and all but the youngest, who's 12, sentenced to death. So local activists in Alabama, including Raymond Parks, began to organize to try to protect and defend the Scottsboro Boys from being executed, and are doing things like bringing the Scottsboro Boys food in prison. And that's what Raymond's doing when she meets him. And so, in the beginning, he's the more public activist, and, and she's more behind the scenes. Uh, but they're having meetings in their house. She'll talk about late-night meetings, guns on the table. Now, by the 1940s, she's wanting to be even more active. Um, her brother is fighting in World War II, like many black men are, and yet most black people can't vote at home. And so she goes to her first Montgomery NAACP meeting in 1943. Um, and she makes it known she wants to register to vote, and a man by the name of Edie Nixon comes by her apartment to bring her some materials, and there will begin a partnership that's going to change the face of American history, because Edie Nixon and Rosa Parks are going to set out to transform Montgomery's NAACP into a much more activist branch. And one of the areas that they are working in are what we would now call issues of racism in the criminal legal system. So there are two kinds of cases, cases where black people and often black men are being wrongfully accused, and cases where black people, and particularly black women, are not protected by the law, and so are being raped or brutalized, and the, and the law does not protect them. And so, Reese Taylor is one such case, but it's only one of many that she's investigating, that they're trying to get justice for. And so, over and over, they try, and over and over, there is no justice. And so, I think one thing that we can see in Rosa Parks's life in this decade, right, from the mid-40s right, till the early to mid-50s, is how many things they're trying and how hard it is, as she would put, to keep going when all our efforts seemed in vain. And so she is getting, as we would call it today, you know, she's getting depressed, she's getting burned out. Um, and so this is taking a toll. And yet, I think one of the things that makes Parks so— um, well, that I admire so much in her is this ability to keep going even when you get discouraged. And that's what we'll see her do. So let's go back to the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, um, to that moment when she refuses to stand up to give her seat to a white man on the bus. This is her arrest on December 1st, 1955, that launched the Montgomery bus boycott. And in this, your feature, Jean, the historian Jean Theo Harris, um, and Rosa Parks in her letters, uh, read by actress Lisa Gay Hamilton, along with Rosa Parks' voice itself. I had finished my day's work, and by the time I walked to the bus, and there was one vacant seat which I took. It was on the third stop when this man got on and was left standing. The front of the bus was reserved for white people, the back of the bus was reserved for black people, and then there's the middle. And the middle is kind of a no man's land that Black people are entitled to sit there, but on the whim of the driver could be asked to move. By the terms of Alabama segregation, all four people in her aisle will have to get up for this one white person to sit down. The driver said, y'all better make it light on yourselves and let me have those seats. I could not see how standing up was going to make it light for me. I thought that 
back to the time when I used to sit up all night and my grandfather would have his gun right by the fireplace. As I sat there and waited to be arrested, didn't know whether I would be manhandled or hurt physically or what would happen. The policeman approached me. He said, why don't you stand up? I said, I don't think I should have to stand up. And I asked him, I said, why do you push us around? He said, I do not know, but the law is the law and you are under arrest. Our guest, Jean Theo Harris, is among those we hear from in this next clip also about the challenges Rosa Parks faced after the Montgomery boy bus boycott, along with Rosa Parks herself and historians Mary Frances Berry, Keisha Blaine, and Robin D.G. Kelly, as well as others. All sorts of rumors snake through Montgomery's white community about Rosa Parks, that she's a NAACP plant, that she's a communist plant. She has a car. She's Mexican that she's not even from Montgomery. We don't often want to talk about the reprisals. We don't want to talk about the consequences and how people make personal sacrifices in order to advance a broader movement. After the incident, I worked five weeks through the month of December and was discharged from my job after the first week in uh, January. The owner of the barbershop on the Air Force Base prohibits, you know, all discussion of Rosa Parks and all discussion of the bus boycott. And Raymond resigns in protest, thinking that, you know, if he can't defend his wife, that, you know, he's being silenced. Dr. King ends up getting the accolades. He is invited everywhere to speak honorarium, makes money, survives, he, he's the hero. The civil rights groups would have her go out and speak at events and raise money, but it never occurred to anybody that they ought to find some way for them to be supported. But I think that part of the way she was treated was because she was a woman, therefore taken advantage. And my is a small town. People had to know that she was no longer working. King, none of them offered her a job. Rose Park was also a prideful woman and would not dare ask. And I don't think she was the kind of woman that would think she was owed. Again, that's a clip from The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks that is premiering on Peacock. Um, Yoruba Richin, if you can talk about this key moment, even this, uh, the moment where she sits down on the bus, um, refuses to get up for a white passenger, is arrested, um, not as much is known about it, uh, certainly the background of her remarkable activist history, but what surprised you most about this period? Well, a couple of things surprised me the most. Um, first off, really digging into what the boycott was was really interesting for me, and that kind of um, rich detail around how it actually worked, that there were, you know, dispatchers, that it was—that it was women led, mostly led by women. Um, hearing from the youth who took part in it was so beautiful, um, and how they, you know, how the the town, the, the black community of Montgomery came together and worked together to, uh, over, you know, a long period of time, almost a year, to make it a success. So that was really um, that was really eye-opening for me um, to see you know actually how it worked and then of course the backlash uh, you know I had known that she went uh, to, you know went to Detroit lived in Detroit spent the last the most part of her life in Detroit but never knew why she why she went why she got there and um, that backlash uh, and the threats to her life and to her uh, well-being, you know, what they, she had to get out of there. Uh, we often think of these um, civil rights leaders as, you know, heroic and make these stances and then everything's fine. Um, but the risk and the, um, the danger 
that they face is often not explored. And uh, we really, you know, obviously that was, that's a key moment to her life um, and part of, uh, and part of what she sacrificed by taking a stand on that bus. And, Professor Thea Harris, what was accomplished in terms of the Supreme Court decision that would come a year later? The, um, how many people knew that it was Rosa Parks who launched Dr. Martin Luther King, really, into the huge public uh, in national and international arena? Right. Um, so. The boycott is 382 days. Um, like Yoruba said, it is massively well organized. They set up 40 pickup stations. They're giving 10 to 15,000 rides a day. This is an incredible black organized women led movement. Two months in, one of the things they had learned. So Rosa Parks is not the first person to get arrested on the bus. There was a, a trickle of people over the decade before Rosa Parks. We we know the name Claudette Colvin eight months earlier. Colvin is arrested on the bus. But about a decade earlier, a woman by the name of Viola White is arrested on the bus. She decides to pursue her case. In response, they do two things. The police rape her daughter. And then the state ties up her appeal in state court and never hears it. So one of the things Montgomery's black community has learned from that is that the state may try to do the same thing with Rosa Parks's case, because now we're post-Brown, so there is much more chance that this could get um, changed on appeal. So what Fred Gray, Rosa Parks' 25-year-old lawyer, decides to do is to file a proactive case into federal court. And that case has four women on it. Claudette Colvin, Mary Louise Smith, two teenagers. Um, Aurelia Browder is—she's the title woman, and an older woman by the name of Susie McDonald. It is that case that goes all the way to the Supreme Court and leads to the desegregation of Montgomery's buses. Um, and so it is this multi-pronged strategy, right? There's Rosa Parks's case. There's this incredibly well-organized boycott. Um, and there, Rosa Parks, as we saw, is traveling that year to raise money um, to keep this boycott going. Then they have this federal case. So it is. There's many tactics that lead to the desegregation of Montgomery's buses on December 21st, 1956. But. That does not stop the suffering of the Parks family. And sadly, leaving Montgomery doesn't stop the suffering. And I think what we see in the Detroit section is that suffering goes on for many, many years. Let's go to the Detroit section. In this clip of the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, we learn about Rosa's life after she moved to Detroit. We hear from Detroit civil rights activist Ed Vaughn, from relatives of Rosa Parks, including her niece, Rhea McCauley, great-nephew Lonnie McCauley, and Parks herself, through her letters, read by Lisa Gay Hamilton. I don't know whether I could have been more effective as a worker for freedom in the South than I am here in Detroit. Really, the same thing that has occurred in the South is existing here to a certain degree. We do have the same problems. Blacks in Detroit were relegated to the worst parts of town called Black Bottom and uh, Hastings Street. But we built homes there and institutions developed there. It was very difficult, you know, to say the least. So what my grandfather do, he would just grow his own food. My father had a green thumb. He'd work all day in the Chrysler's plant. And then he would come home and work a garden. We grew up on uh, fresh tomatoes, green peppers, onions. There was enough food in that little plot for him, grandmother, Auntie Rose, and Uncle Parks. Rosa Parks is a very creative person, and she would take found objects and create stuff out of them, you know, of course, dresses and ideas of quilts. She taught us how to sew. The stitches were absolutely perfect. She could tailor anything. She could look at something and go home and sew it. From the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, uh, talk about this period, Yoruba, in Detroit. And, of course, that's where, well, when she died, the big funeral was, but how Detroit shaped her. Yeah, and how she shaped Detroit. I mean, you go there now, and you have murals, you have Rosa Parks Boulevard. Um, her imprint in that city is really palpable. Um, so, 
the northern promised land that was it, I think, describes it all. And, of course, she's there throughout the uh, uprisings that happened in Detroit. At that time, the, the, the biggest uprising, uh, racial uprising, uh, the, this country had seen. She is um, there uh, on the on the um, the People's Tribunal, which <clears throat> excuse me, which uh, was put together by the people of Detroit, by the black people of Detroit, in response to the killing at Al uh, at Algiers Motel, um, that uh, of the the young boys and who were getting no justice uh, by the police. I mean, Detroit has a like many cities, but Detroit had had a uh, notorious relationship, violent relationship with the black community. Um, and she uh, was part of a tribunal that was at the Church of the Black Madonna, uh, a militant black church, very famous church, activist church, uh, that she also uh, uh, w was a part of and, and, and uh, attended. Um, and they put on a tribunal, and they had— uh, you know, to seek justice, some kind of justice, uh, for the for the for the young boys and the uh, and to you know give the to to rule that these officers were were guilty. Um, her, she worked for John Conyers. Um, he she helped him get elected, and work that was her first paid political job. Um, and Conyers, she was you know Conyers was the first. Um, uh, Congressman to introduce the H.R. 40, the reparations bill. She was a supporter of reparations. I mean, her uh, support for the black freedom struggle all through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, up until she passed, was, you know, through the work that was going on in Conyers' office and, and in Detroit. We continue to look at the new Peacock documentary, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, that premieres Wednesday. On Friday, I spoke with the film's co-director, Yoruba Richin, and Brooklyn College professor Jean Theo Harris. I asked her to talk about how Rosa Parks had no problem supporting both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Exactly. She saw no contradiction. In fact, she would describe Malcolm X as her personal hero, and yet it saw no contradiction with that and her incredible love and respect for Dr. King. She embraced Ella Baker and Queen Mother Moore, right? This is, we hear Joanne Watson in the film talk about her being holistic, that this, that one of the things that Mrs. Parks is so good at is that she shows up for everything. She is looking for all different kinds of strategies to challenge the, the kind of racial injustice in this country, the social injustice, poverty, war, right? She, she has a whole platter of issues that she's working on, and she's not—she refuses to choose. She's, you know, she is part of the NAACP, and yet she's doing all of this work in the late 60s and 1970s around political prisoner cases from— um, Angela Davis, to the Wilmington 10, to the RNA 11, and we see in the film um, what happens to the Republic of New Africa, which is actually born in Detroit, is a reparations black power group um, at, before it moves to Mississippi. Uh, she's, a, she's a longtime supporter of reparations. She is an early opponent of the war in Vietnam. In fact, that's part of why she's supporting John Conyers in 1964 and helping him get elected, because he is such a staunch union person, like she is. He is already out against Vietnam, like she is. And um, she, her job for Conyers really ends this decade of suffering for the Parks family. Uh, she had been working at what we could call a glorified sweatshop in the early 60s. Um, Conyers' job comes with health insurance. Both she and Raymond had had um, a number of health issues for her related to the stress of this work. Uh, I think we don't often understand the kind of toll this takes. We, we honor Rosa Parks, but we erase, right, what is a decade of suffering, really, for her and her family. Um, but then she's on the ground doing constituent work with John Conyers, doing work to challenge Detroit's racism and traveling the country, taking part in the Black Power Convention in Philadelphia. She's on staff at the National Black Political Convention in Gary. She 
uh, is at the one of the first meetings of NCOBRA, which is a reparations group. She's doing work around South African divestment. When I was doing interviews for the book, I interviewed a lot of people who had worked with her in Detroit in these years. and. Over and over, people would say she was everywhere. They would say, I would go there and I'd be surprised, here's Rosa again. Over and over, at so many different political groups, rallies, marches, mobilizations, she was there. Mm. So I want to go back to this remarkable film, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, and look at how being a woman shaped her participation in the civil rights struggle. This clip features the historian Mary Frances Berry and Erica Huggins of the Black Panther Party, activist Gloria Richardson, former Detroit City Council member John Watson, and Rosa Parks in her own words, again read from her letters by actress Lisa Gay Hamilton. I was with the March on Washington in 1963. That was a great occasion, but women were not allowed to play much of a role. The March on Washington is one example of how black women are often marginalized in the civil rights movement. If you look at those who spoke, with the exception of Daisy Bates, who only spoke for a few minutes, the entire program was dominated by men. There was a tribute to women in which A. Philip Randolph, one of the organizers of the march, introduced some of the women who had participated in the struggle, and I was one of them. They would have her stand up and wave at people. There's Rosa Parks, you know, she sat down on the bus in Montgomery, wave at him, Rosa Parks, Mrs. Parks, and she sat down. They never said anything beyond that. I was 15 when I went to the March on Washington. I stood there in awe of all of the people that had gathered. And I remember Lena Horne moving swiftly to the front of the stage, picked up a microphone and sung two syllables. Freedom! And they lingered in the air. There was a blanket of silence. She was taking Rosa Parks around to European satellite stations and saying, this is the woman that started Montgomery. This is it. So when I saw her doing that, I joined her. We were determined to see that Rosa Parks was recognized. There's so much patriarchy built into the movement, like it's built into so many institutions. Women raise most of the money, do most of the organizing. But when you go back and check the record, those who've been labeled presidents or directors or the leaders, or the grand poobah, the, largely have been men, while the women have done the work. And Mother Parks, uh, she was doing the work. As you refer to her as Mrs. Parks, talk about your use, I mean, even in the title, uh, The Rebellious Life, not of Rosa Parks, but of Mrs. Rosa Parks, the significance of that honorific for uh, Mrs. Parks. Well, I have to defer to, to Jean around that, but I know that as soon as all I remember is that as soon as we started working uh, on this film, we started referring to her as a Mrs. Parks, and I think that was a, a Jean directive. Jean. <laughs> So, I mean, certainly, if you talk to anybody who knew Mrs. Parks, they refer to her as Mrs. Parks. Um, and, and certainly, I remember as we started to do interviews, I was like, people are not going to—they are always going to say it, so we always have to say it, right? Um, and I think the Mrs. does a couple of things. I think the first is, it is an honorific that black women, black women particularly black women of Rosa Parks's generation did not get. And so, it is not surprising, then, that everyone who talks about Mrs. Parks, who knew her, are fastidious about using it, because it is giving her a kind of honorific that she was often denied. Um, I think there's a second reason that I use it in the book, which is that I think Rosa Parks rolls off the tongue, we think we know her, and I I think part of putting the misses there was to stop us a little bit, to, to make us have to both take a step back that she's not ours, right, that we don't just get to use her however we want, but also that we might not know her. Um, and, and so I really fought to have misses in the title. I also think it just—the cadence of it is really lovely. Um, but, but 
basically, this is how anyone who knew her referred to her, and I think it makes us have to come to her and learn about her in a different way. Go ahead, Yoruba. Oh, I was just—I was going to say, I also love how Joanne Watson refers to her as Mother Parks yes. as well. Yeah. So we want to end with one more clip from the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. This is about the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., beginning with Sam Cooke's song, A Change Is Gonna Come. We also hear from Rosa Parks' niece, Rhea Cauley. I was born was like medicine to the soul. Oh, yes, it it was as if Dr. King was speaking directly to me. I rarely saw her show emotion, but when Dr. King was assassinated, I saw her cry at his funeral. I was losing the people I love best. My husband and brother were all sick, and there was a time when I was traveling every day to three different hospitals to visit them. I had to quit working full-time and work only part-time. Auntie Rose and Uncle Parks loved each other till the end. As Uncle Parks' health deteriorated, um, the loving way that she would take care of him, they were so closely joined together. Parks died in 1977, when he was 74, after a five-year struggle against cancer. My brother Sylvester died three months after that, also of cancer. Mama was ill with cancer, too. I cared for her at home until she died at the age of 91. That from the life, the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. Um, as we begin to wrap up, uh, Yoruba Richen, um, if you can talk about what Rosa Parks' life means for today, the idea that rights not fully achieved, not in the film, but very interesting, is her fierce opposition to Clarence Thomas becoming a Supreme Court justice, saying it would not represent a step forward in the road to racial progress, but a U-turn on that road, like his statements on Brown v. Board of Education and even on Roe v. Wade. Talk about this. Yeah, I mean— it's quite remarkable, um, you know, that uh, her speaking out against his nomination and what we're going through today. I mean, granted, you know, when he was nominated, many of us knew this was not a, a positive thing for, for our civil rights. But she, as uh, somebody, um, you know, who was who was well who was uh, you know obviously well known and and considered the mother of the of the movement um her speaking out against him was very important and uh those words ring true today um we're seeing a a total retrenchment of you know of so many rights uh from uh women's rights uh to civil rights um uh, gun rights, uh, I'm sorry, gun uh, control, um, a, a bunch of other cases that are on the docket that are uh, in danger of taking away other rights. Um, so Mrs. Parks, you know, sat on—I I think of how she sat with her grandfather uh, in the early 1900s, uh, facing the KKK and, and defending, with him defending his house, and, you know, where we are today. And that she never stopped fighting for that for that justice, and knew that we weren't there even at the end of her life, and obviously we're still not now. But gives us some gives me some inspiration um, and hope that you have to keep on keeping on. And I think Miss Parks knew that.
Yuru Barichin, co-director with Joanna Hamilton of the new Peacock documentary, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. It premieres on Wednesday. Yoruba is the founding director of the documentary program at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, the City University of New York. The film is based on the biography by the same name um, uh, that was written by Brooklyn College professor Jean Theo Harris. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! is currently accepting applications for Video News Production Fellowship and a People and Culture Manager. You can learn more and apply at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warrenoff, Tarina Nadura, Sam Alcoff, Tay Maria Studio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Massoud, and Mary Conlon. Our executive director is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, John Randolph, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Hugh Grant, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, and Dennis McCormick. To see all our shows, you can go to any podcast platform or democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Stay safe.